Um, we're talking today about something that I, I know all of us have encountered from time to time, and that are these things called relationships. And we were, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we're created for relationships. That's um, God himself is a triune God, and he created us in his image. And so therefore, we're all made for relationships. But here's the big problem. The problem with relationships come when you, uh, you have relationships with people that you like and usually stay away from people that you don't like, right? That's, that's pretty simple. But, but what happens when the people that you like make you mad? Um, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it happens to me occasionally. You'll be in a relationship with someone, and I'm not speaking um, husband and wife relationship. I'm talking about just kind of general friendships. And, and you just, you get mad at them. They do something that really makes you angry and you have to stay in relationship with that person or you bail out of relationship with that person. What do you do with that? Sometimes in a pastor's life, you have to, uh, you have to really think about illustrations. Um, and sometimes they just fall in your lap and, and they, they kind of fell into our lap this morning. By the way, um, happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Rarely does uh, Valentine's Day fall on a Sunday, so uh, it's kind of neat. We got to celebrate with the family last night. We went out to eat and had some fun with the family. But um, my wife called me this morning <clears throat> about, um, about 10 o'clock, uh, 10 o'clock this morning, a few minutes before 10, which was kind of weird because she, was, she you know, would have been on her way to church. About 10 days ago, two weeks ago, uh, we contacted the children's minister or the um, youth, youth pastor and said, hey, would you teach kids church today? Because she doesn't ever get to come to church. And so she wanted us to come to church and, and just kind of be a part. So we were excited about that. Planned it a couple weeks ago. And then I got a call from her this morning a few minutes before 10, and, which was weird. So I answered the phone. And I'm like, hello. And, uh, and she said, I don't have a car seat. And for those of you that know, we live about, about 18 minutes away to be exact. And so I'm trying to do the math, figure out, can I get home and can I not get home? Um, and then I realized that we had taken the car seats out of the car um, before that. And so she didn't have one. And so she said to me in a kind of an odd turn of events, she said, anyway, enough about that. Um, I think in light of Valentine's Day, we should uh, start thinking about adoption again. I'm like, well, maybe, you know, I'm going to preach in 30 minutes. It's kind of weird to have this conversation now. And she said, yeah, no, I really want to start considering adoption. Um, either I'm going to kill my youngest son or we're going to put him up for adoption. So <laughs> you get to pick. Um, I'm going to show you today how this happened. I'm a planner. For those of you that know me, I, I don't like a lot of details, but I like details being handled. Um, so... Yesterday, we, we had to move some car seats. We took Paisley, different places. We did all this kind of stuff. And so um, last night when we went out to eat, we had to take the car seat out of her car, which was kind of weird. I saw kind of all this coming down. Um, and so I just want to show you a little a, a text message um, that happened yesterday. This is my youngest son, Josh. And um, so I sent him a text message, and I have to save this. My wife, who is now stuck at home with no car seats, watching this online. So, honey, on Valentine's Day, just so you know, this was not my fault. It was your son's. I sent him a text that says, hey, if you get Paisley's car seat out of your truck, I'll put it in mine. So, if you just, all you have to do is get it out. That's it. Just unclip the thing, get it out, and I will be the one. And, and let me just draw your attention. I don't know what screen you're looking on. But that text was sent yesterday at, I don't know if you can see that. It says 5.27 p.m. yesterday on a Saturday. You know, when it was read, it was read at 9.18 this morning. You know where my son was at 9.18 this morning? Standing right over there by the bass guitar with the car seat in his truck. So this is a perfect example of, of, of relationships where you kind of still have to be in relationship with Josh. I don't know. That may change when we get home. Who knows? Um, if anybody has an open spot for him, you could use it. <laughs> and he knows I'm not joking at all. It's, it's that bad. How, how do you deal with relationships when you don't want to be in a relationship with someone, but you're forced to be, or better, because here's what we do. How do you, I mean, I want to be in relationship with you, I think. I mean, I'll let you know when I get home to my wife. But how do you, how do you deal with relationships when, um, when there's someone who has something that you want? 
Because here's where the rubber kind of meets the road. We have a problem, and I have a problem, and I'll give you a couple examples, but I have a problem of, of comparing myself to other people, and you see how their relationships work. And what's interesting is, I know for you guys that have teenagers or older kids, um, maybe you've never experienced anything like I just described. I'm sure every time you text your kids, they read it immediately. They don't wait how many hours that is to, to read it. Um, and by the way, I had someone say, well, that's your first mistake. You turned your read receipts on. And I'm like, I tell my kids, I paid a phone bill. You turn your read receipts on. I want to know that you saw what I sent you. So maybe you've never experienced anything like that with teenagers. Um, but, but if you don't, I would compare myself to you. I would think, boy, if I only had teenagers like the nobles, that would be great. Because their girls, they do everything perfect all the time. And they... You know, go clean your room. Yes, mother, father, I'm going. And it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Um, the roof's the same way. The girls are just perfect. So why can't I have kids like that? And so I pick and choose to compare myself with that. And that is what we're going to talk about today, the comparison trap. And then what, what does the Bible say about that? What does the Bible say about your value in how God created you? So my plan, my hope is today is that when we're done, you can see that the way that you're created has value. And the way that God wired you is exactly the way that he wanted you. So if you're taking notes, um, let's go through some of this because I want you to see uh, exactly what I mean. Here, here's the opening stages of the Bible. So from the very beginning, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So this is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit saying, let us make us, all of our creation, to look like us. Because they, they, he was the, the triune God. So God was already in community. God was al already together. Everything was perfect when, when God created us. But here is what happened. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Sin destroyed perfect community. Because this is not what God intended. God did not intend for my wife to want to end the relationship with our youngest son, right? That, that's not the way it was created. It was created to be different. But we messed it up with sin. Here's, here's where this gets interesting. So think about creation. Um, the fall fractured perfect relationship. So we had perfect community with God. And then we fell from sin, and we jacked it all up. It lasted. That's what's the greatest thing in the Bible. Um, so if you're kind of a student of the Bible, you'll know when you read through it. Uh, everything was going great for like the first two chapters. And it was after that, we messed it up. We blew it. So Adam and Eve were created, think about this, in a perfect communion. They never fought. Um, if, if Adam wanted to go buy a Harley Davidson motorcycle, Eve would say, yes, of course we have the money. Just go spend it. If Eve wanted to buy a new kitchen table that Adam didn't think that she needed, um, Adam would say, sure, honey, go buy the kitchen table. And they would do this. It was great. And then the fall happened and everything fell apart. Remember, at this point, they were, they were naked together. They were unashamed. They were fully known. They knew everything about each other, Right. Then, when you read through Genesis, what you find, as soon as sin entered the world, what's the first thing that they did? They covered themselves up. At the first, the first sign of sin that hit the earth, the first thing that we did is start hiding ourselves from others. And then they hid from God. From day, whatever it was in the Bible, they started putting up shields. It's not how God created it. God created community to be perfect, but sin destroyed that. Okay, so let's keep going, because now we're going to see what we do with it. Culture, our culture, especially in 2021, encourages comparison. So think about this. Whether you um, are, are a person that is really into the social media scene, or maybe you're not, um, or whether you're just living life normally and you have no idea what's going on in social media or in the news, our culture encourages you and I to compare ourselves to others. That's how they make money. 
If you don't have this, you need this. If you don't have the other, you, you need the other. So um, I know I just mentioned it, but I'll bring it up again. Um, Jim Noble wanted a new motorcycle, right? So he sold me his old motorcycle. He waited a little bit and bought a new motorcycle. And it was bigger, louder, faster. I was totally content with the motorcycle that he sold me until he got his new one. <laughs> and now I'm like, I think it's time for him to get another new one so that I can buy his new new one, his newer new one, and he can get a newer, newer, newer new one. And, and this cycle doesn't stop. And, and I guess I would have been totally content until I, I, I have something or I look at someone who has something different and I start comparing myself. That's what culture is built on. I, I can tell you how excited I was to drive away from Bozeman one time with a drift boat that um, I bought. I saved up cash and, and, I, and I drove off and bought it and was driving home. I was on cloud nine for a couple of years until I rode in a friend of mine's drift boat who has some new features and now I'm not really satisfied with mine because I'm comparing myself to other people. Now, some of you are old enough to know when the uh, Victoria's Secret ads first came out. Raise your hand. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't read Not on Valentine's Day. Do not raise your hand. You're like, is that a company? I don't know. I've never heard of it. Um, some of you remember when the Victoria's Secret ads first came out. And if, you, if you're of that age, when you remember when it first came out, we were watching on TV and um, the first commercial's free, right? After that, you should probably change the channel. But um, the first time you were like, what is going on on public television? Right? I mean, can you really do that on public television? Can you show that kind of thing? Well, you might remember a few years after that, Dove Company, the company that makes soaps and stuff, they came out with a counter campaign for um, the Victoria's Secret type deal. So they have the Victoria's Secret supermodels, um, and then Dove came out with a different campaign, and their whole campaign was built around um, what they would consider to be average women, the normal person, not the made-up, airbrushed Victoria's Secret supermodel. Some of you remember this when it first came out. Let me just show you their marketing campaign. A guy by the name of Philippe something, I can't even pronounce his last name. He was the marketing director for what they called um, Dove's Campaign for Real Beauty. Okay, listen to this. Quote from their website, it says... Our mission is to make more women feel beautiful every day by broadening the definition of beauty. And when we all read that, we were like, oh, that's great, right? No more of these Victoria's Secret models. That's not real. They're all airbrushed anyway. It's not real. You know, let's get right back to this. No, listen to what he said. Our mission is to make more women feel beautiful every day. Did you hear what that means? I mean, you're, you're not. We just want you to feel that way. <laughs> and so then there was like this counterattack to them that's like, well, wait, what do you mean you want us to feel that way? Are we not beautiful already? And to which they would respond, well, yeah, but we, we want you to feel like you're a victorious. We want, to, we want to make this popular just to be in the normal person. And so that campaign, which some of it's still going on today, kind of began to crumble. And so they said, we want you to feel like you're beautiful. And they, the underlining, even if you're not. Um, and so we want you to buy our new lotion that helps hide cellulite. Right? I mean, the, the, when you think about the whole campaign, it's offensive. The whole campaign itself, because regardless of how much they try to push this new, what do they call it? Um, the, the real beauty campaign, people are going to compare yourself to other people and then you become jealous of them so he, this is not new to us right it's not like we're living in i think at this point this was like um 2009 2007 somewhere around there when this whole thing came out uh it's not like it was new because ecclesiastes dealt with this exact same thing years ago written by uh, somewhere around the year 931 or before, we're not exactly sure, B.C., so several thousand years ago, written by King Solomon. And listen to what Ecclesiastes says. Knowing that you were going to compare yourself to other people and that I was going to compare myself to other people, he said, and I saw that all 
toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. But all of our toil and everything we try to achieve, it basically springs from envy, from comparing ourselves to other people. This too is meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. Why? Because you were satisfied with your motorcycle until they got a new one and now you want a new, new one. And so this, this train doesn't ever stop and, it, and, and we're on it in our culture. And so let me give you the, the kind of the end of the road here and then we'll talk about how we defeat it. We're not going to defeat it in culture. Culture cannot exist. Um, macro and even microeconomics cannot exist if you are satisfied. If you're satisfied, you don't need to buy anything else unless something breaks. That's not the way things are built. They want you to have newer, better type things in your life. But here's the difference. In the world in which we live in, the things that we do, Christ offers contentment, real contentment. So hopefully, if you're listening to this, you are either a follower of Jesus Christ or you desire to be a follower of Jesus Christ, maybe you don't know what that means yet, or, or maybe someone talked you into listening to it, or someone sent it to you, or, or whatever the case may be, if you're watching online or, or whatnot. But you have this thought about God in your life. Well, here's the cool thing. One of the things that Jesus offers to us is not just salvation at the end of our life. That's great. When I die, I, I believe because of what the Word of God teaches and because of the evidence I've seen in my life that I will spend eternity with God in heaven, and that's a great thing. But if I don't die for another 30, 40, 50 years, then I have to live on this earth. So salvation doesn't just take care of you after death. Salvation helps before you die. And of all the things it gives you, one of the things it gives you is contentment. Being able to say that you have so much value that Christ was willing to do the unheard of to redeem you. And if you don't believe that, I'm going to just walk you through it. We're going to do a little bit of what we call biblical exegesis. And I'm going to show you a, a, some scripture that just walks us through exactly what this means. Um, do you, so here's, if you don't know anything about economics or if you've never taken a class on finance or something like that, Think about how you determine the value of something. The value of something is not determined by its price tag. The value of something is determined by um, what price it will bring in any given market. That's why oil prices go up, right? If you see gas prices going up, it's because it brings more money for that same product just because something changed. The stock market, uh, remember during the election, all kinds of crazy things happening in the stock market because the value of something changes depending on what someone is willing to pay for it. And I just totally ruined myself because now Jim's like, oh, he really wants my motorcycle. Now I'm going to charge him a little bit more because I can make more, right? That's how value is determined. So ask yourself this, what's your value? How would you determine your value? How much is... Greg Payton Worth. Um, we we uh, went through kind of a pretty tragic time in our in our family um, a few months ago when when um, Jesse's dad died, and I, it caused me to do a lot of thinking about something were to happen to me and my family, and you know, kind of leaving them. Um, Jesse's dad left left him in a good situation and, and just took care of things, and so I was thinking, I want to do that. I, I want to. If I'm removed from this life, I want my family to be able to continue to, to function and live in some, some sort of a way. And so as I began to do that, I began to think, man, I have a lot of value to my family, but you know, maybe there's value to the church, maybe there's value to the community, even to my neighborhood, to different organizations that I'm with. So how do you determine your value? Well, here's your value. Your value is determined um, by basically auctioning yourself off to the highest bidder. Basically saying, how much is someone willing to pay for you? What's the price that someone would be willing to pay for you or for me? Okay, so if you're, if you're a Bible student, you're kind of seeing this already. That's the gospel. Your value was so great 
that Jesus Christ was willing to put up his own life to purchase your redemption. Jesus thought you were so incredibly valuable that God would send his only son to redeem you. That's how much value you have. That's how significant you are in what you do. So let me read you this scripture. So if you have a Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 is exactly where this speaks about this um, and it makes it pretty easy for us to understand. Here's what it says. Paul, writing to a church, right? So Galatians is a letter written to a church in Galatia, um, and he's talking to them about something similar. And here's what he says. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So when everything was perfect, God said, now it's time to redeem my people. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to send Jesus to the people that were born under the law. That's you and me. We were born under the law, which is the first half of the, Old Te- uh, of the Bible, the Old Testament. Do you know what the law does? The law basically says you're not good enough on your own. And the law is pretty simple. If you can keep all 613 or how many they figured out now, if you can keep all of the laws in the Old Testament, then God will be pleased and your faith will earn you um, a place in heaven with God. And here's what we found. No one except for Jesus could do that. And I wonder if anyone tried. I wonder if anyone back in the day thought, I'm going to try to keep every single law forever and not break any of them. No. The law was created so that you would see that on your own, you cannot achieve perfection. You can't. You needed someone to redeem you. So we were born under the law. So he sent someone, Jesus, uh, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. That's you and me. Look at the next next verse. Um, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption. Meaning, Jesus would come, would say, I'm going to fulfill the law and adopt you. Okay, so when the church in Galatia read this, here's what's kind of neat. So imagine, um, I don't know if if he was standing, probably sitting at this point, but he, they'd take this letter and he would say, okay, I got a letter from the Apostle Paul. I'm going to read it to you. And he'd read it to the church. And he started talking about adoption. So when he said this verse, he said, so that we might receive adoption. Everyone in that Jewish community would have went, why are we talking about adoption? Because until this point, the Jews had no concept of adoption. That was a very Greek and Roman thing. The Jews did not practice adoption. So what Paul did is Paul looked into his culture trying to make an analogy of what it's like to be in the family of God. He said, it's kind of like the Greeks and Romans do. It's kind of like being adopted. And when, when the people in that church heard this from the letter the first time, they were like, wow, because here's what adoption did. So back in those days, um, you didn't adopt children. Why? Because you didn't know how they were going to turn out. You waited until they got older, and then you adopted them. That's brilliant, right? I know now I have a 19-year-old that I want to adopt. I want to get him out. Um, And some of you are like, I'm not going to adopt him because I see he doesn't read text messages, doesn't do what he's supposed to do. This is a perfect scenario. You know what you're going to get. And so when Paul used this, there's another example, um, Julius Caesar. And so... Um, As the Caesars grew through Rome, remember Caesar Augustus from the Christmas story? He didn't like his children. So he had several children. I don't know exactly how many. He didn't like any of them. And he wanted a son to replace him as Caesar. He didn't like any of them. So what he did is he adopted Tiberius Caesar, who would be the next Caesar. He adopted him to be his son. You know how old Tiberius was when he adopted him? 40 years old. So he looked around and he said, I'm not going to adopt a kid because I don't know how they're going to turn out. I'm going to adopt Tiberius Caesar into my family, became a son of Caesar Augustus, and then became the next Caesar of Rome. So this is how, when Paul looks back, he says, that's what God did. 
God knew your value, and when the time was right, sent Jesus to redeem you. So another way of phrasing this would be to redeem those who were already jacked up. He wasn't redeeming perfect people. God knew what he was buying when he bought you. He knew exactly what you like. Tiberius sees you, 40 years old. God knew exactly how you were going to turn out. God knew your quirks. God knew the things that you would mess up. And he still sent Jesus to redeem you so that we might receive adoption. And the next part sounds a little bit offensive in, in our day and age, but let me explain it to you. That we might receive adoption, look at the last part, as sons. Now, if you don't know the... Um, Greek culture, what you would think is, well, that just seems, you know, chauvinistic. Why sons and why not daughters? Well, back in those days, no one adopted daughters. That was just crazy. They adopted sons because they could pass their line through their sons. If you ended up, let's just say that I had a brother and my brother died, I would then have to take my brother's wife into my family. And then I could choose whether I wanted to adopt the kids or not adopt the kids. I wouldn't to the girls. They would just kind of turn out however they turned out. But if I chose to adopt the son, then the son would be in my line to receive all of my fortune. Unfortunately, in those days, the daughters didn't. And so what Paul is saying is, Jesus came to redeem you so that you would be adopted as sons. You know what that means? That means you get the farm. You get everything. You are now in that place where not only are you adopted and just kind of brought into the household, you're adopted to the point where now you get the benefits of being a child of God. So literally, we inherit the kingdom of heaven when we're adopted by Jesus, when he chooses to adopt us. One of the neat things um, about adoption is in this day and age, um, you, I can disown my three kids, which my first story, it's probably going to happen, uh, but I can't Paisley. I can't, can't ever disown her. I could, I could totally disown my three boys. Think about it often. <laughs> Cannot with Paisley. Can't. The law won't allow it. So adoption in this instance is the most beautiful picture of what happens to us when we are redeemed as sons when God pulls everything together and literally offers us the type of contentment that we need. So if he offers this, the reason I walk through this Galatians passage is I want you to see your value, right? So think about that. In the eyes of God, you have tremendous value. And most of you would think, um, well, yeah, but you don't know what I've done and, and you're just saying that because you're a pastor and you live a good life and this, that. Listen, that could not be further from the truth. When the fullness of time came, God sent Jesus to redeem you and he knew what he was getting. He knew how messed up you would be. That's why in a church setting, um, I love it when people come in and and they're messed up. If you've, if you've ever, I hope, I hope that you've had a chance to lead someone to Jesus. But even better, I hope you've had a chance to lead someone to Jesus who knew nothing at all about church or about Jesus. It's the most amazing thing in the world watching them grow. The few times I've done that, I did it with one guy. And, and the, the, the cuss words that flew around at the church Christmas party, I'm not kidding you. Um, there, one word, like the worst word, I think, was used like four or five times in the middle of a Christmas party with 85-year-old Martha Tidwell sitting right on my couch, and he's just letting him fly because he had no idea. He was growing up into the body of Christ. That's one of the greatest things about what happens in our value. God knew what he was like, and he purchased him anyway. God knew his value and he purchased him anyway. So regardless of what you think, regardless of you sitting there thinking, well, they don't know about my past, you don't know what I think, it, it doesn't matter. God thought you were so valuable, he sent his son to die for you. Think about that. Who else has done that? Can I be honest? I love you. 
But I don't know that I'd die for you. As a matter of fact, we have a um, we have like a security plan here at church. Um, if you know, God forbid anything awful were to happen, how do we protect you? How do we whatever? Um, and, and and I asked Marty, I was like, uh, so in our security plan, how do I get out? <laughs> right, and I'm kind of a target up here, obviously. And so so kind of what my first thought wasn't how how do I protect Jabo? How do I protect him? Because I I mean I like the guy, but. I don't know that I would give my life for you. But Jesus did. Who else has? Does that not determine your value? Does that not show you how valuable you are? So if you're that valuable, why in the world do we compare ourselves to other people? Why in the world do you look to someone else and compare yourself to them? So when you think about this, think about when you compare yourself to others, who are you really blaming who is it that, if you want to compare yourself to, who are you blaming that you don't have that? Because, because I think we're blaming someone. Here's what I do. I compare my, comparison is ugly all the time. There's never an instance where comparison is a good thing. Now, there are times when you would say, well, this person is a more mature follower of Christ I'm envious of that. I want to be a more mature follower of Christ. How do I do that? Okay, there might be some instances where it's a good thing. Um, but that's normally not what we do. I have, as your pastor, this wasn't that long ago. This was you know, seven, eight years ago. Um, I have sat in a, in, a, in a bleachers during a football game watching my oldest son play football. And, and he, for those that don't know, he's the one that plays the drums. And he's a big guy, strong as an ox. And... They would, he would mess up. He had a problem, and I, I forgot what it was, but he would like step with the wrong foot or something like that. Evidently, when you, you, know, you got to step with the right foot, coach would get mad and pull him out of the game. Pull him out for a couple of plays, which is like in high school, it's like timeout, right? You go sit on the bench, you're in timeout for a couple of plays. He'd pull him off. You know what I would think in the stands? I would sit there and think, I hope the quarterback gets sacked. My team. My quarterback, my people I want to win, and my first thought was, well, I just hope he gets sacked. i show you to pull my kid out of the game because not only am I comparing I want my kid to be the best, I want something bad to happen to you. If, if I can't have what you have, then I wish ill will on you. How messed up is that? And we would never admit it. That's one of the cool things about being the pastor is I'm, I'm supposed to say the things that you think but would never say is that's one of them. Because I don't have a relationship with my spouse like that other person does. I bet he's cheating on her. And then you find out this, this family that you've idolized forever because they look like their marriage is just perfect and you think, I wish my husband were like this or I wish my wife were like this and you idolize them. And then you find out later that they're getting a divorce. You don't have to shake your head yes or no because I know it's true. Don't you? It's sometimes there's a small part of you that thinks, good, because I wasn't like that. that. That, I mean, I know there's no level in sin. That's bad. That's where we are. Christ thought you were so valuable that he sent his son to die for you and I can't stop comparing myself to someone else. And it cost us, like when I was an insurance agent, there's a lifestyle you're supposed to live with insurance. You're supposed to go through a bunch of years. When I started back in the telemarketing days, literally they put a phone directory on my desk and said, make a living. And I just started in um, P, because my last name was P, and I started going through the phone book, calling people at home. Hey, this is Greg Payton, Farmers Insurance. If you have just a second, I'd like to see if I can save you money on your car insurance. And I would do that for three hours a night from 6 o'clock or 5.30 to about 8.30 every single night of the week until I got 10 appointments and I could go home. That's, that's how I made a living, back when telemarketing used to work. And when I did that, that's how my life was. But then there's a point at which you have so many people people that you stop doing that or you hire someone else to do that now you have to live the life and here's what that means you have to drive a certain car and you have to join a country club because that you just got to play golf 
You have to, that's, and I'm a, I'm a, a great golfer in my mind, um, on the course, maybe not so much, but in my mind, I'm a phenomenal golfer. So we joined a country club. It cost us money to keep up with the Joneses. And, and it just doesn't stop. And now you find yourself comparing yourself to other pastors or other churches. If I only had this or if I only had those people. Who, when we do that, and I know I'm saying this being a little bit transparent because I know you're in the exact same situation. Who are we really blaming? I'll tell you, we're really blaming God. We're really looking at God and saying, if I had what those other people have, then my life would be so much better. I mean, I could do that. And here's how I know this. Um, when we talk about giving, there are people that will say, well, if I made money that, that they made, of course I would give because I would have the money to do it. You wouldn't because generosity just comes from the heart. doesn't matter how much you have because we cannot stop comparing ourselves to other people. I'm going to show you something real quick that you've probably never seen. You may have seen it before. Um, but here's how we blame God for, for what we get. There's a parable in the Bible. By the way, a parable is a made-up story by Jesus to prove a point. So Jesus made up this. It's called the parable of the talents. And so here's, here's what it means. If you want to read it later, you can. It's Matthew 25. Um, and Jesus basically said, so there's this master, and the master goes away on a trip. And before he goes away on a trip, he calls in three of his servants. To one servant, he gave five talents, or I think the NIV is like five bags of gold. To another one, he gave two, and to another one, he gave one. So this master is leaving. Remember, Jesus is telling this story. The story didn't really happen. Jesus is telling the story to prove a point. And he says that you, you get to do all these things. You get five bags of gold. You get two. You get one. Well, in the story of the parable of the talents, when the master comes back and collects the debt, the guy with five talents takes the five talents, does great things with them, and ends up with ten talents and gives them to the master. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Most of you have heard this, this talent or this parable before. To the second guy who got two bags of gold, he said, what would you do with my two bags of gold? He's like, hey, he gave me two bags of gold. I gave you four bags of gold back. I made you more back. You know, and the master said, well done, my good and faithful slave. Um, so everything's great with those two, but it's the third one, and I've seen this preached different ways. I've even preached it different ways, but there's something interesting in what happens to the guy that received the one talent. There's something interesting in the way he responds. So in the story, in the parable, he gives one guy one bag of gold, and so the guy goes and hides it so that he doesn't lose it. The master comes back and he, he makes the statement to, to the master and says, look, here's your bag of gold back, you know, blah, 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 thinking that he would be rewarded for it. And then the master says, you evil, wicked slave, is what he called him, this, you're awful. You could have at least done something with it, but you chose not to. Now, here's the way this plays out. And I'm going to show you the verse because here's what's interesting. As the master is handing out talents... This guy over here is watching this thing unfold, and he sees that guy gets five, and that guy gets two, and I only get one. And so what immediately goes through his mind is, well, if I'd have gotten five, of course I could have done something with it. If I would have gotten two, of course I would have done something with it. Listen to how he responds and I don't know if you've ever seen this. When I saw this, this was amazing. Look at how this third guy responds. He says, um, this is the third guy. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward and said, and here goes the blame game. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. See, basically, this is your fault. This is, this is your fault. So what I did, um, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. Do you see what this guy's doing? Is he's saying, you know what? You only gave me one talent. 
If I would have had five talents, I could have done so much more. If I'd have had two talents, I could have done so much more. But I only had one talent. If you would have given me more, I could have done more. This is the comparison trap spoken from Jesus 2,000 years ago of not being able to be content with what you have. Not being able to be content with what God has given you because here's the real truth. God has entrusted certain things to you, hasn't he? So God has given you in your life what he thinks you need. And so here's what we do. We put up like a bookshelf, and on that bookshelf is your family, the time you're going to live, your job, and we look at it and say, that's our life. And here's what I do and what you do. I look at someone else's job and I say, I'd like to have that job. Or I want to have this other person's family. I want to have this other person's health. I want to have this other person's this. And we create this fictitious person, listen, that doesn't exist We take a highlight reel of everyone who's perfect. We take the best part of their life and say, well, yeah, God, but if I had this person's family and this person's money and this person's health and this person's kids, then I could do something for your kingdom and I would have value. Silly that sounds. If I could create this perfect being, then I would be able to do what I'm supposed to for your sake. God would say, did you not just just realize I redeemed you, I adopted you, and I knew what I was getting, and you were what I wanted. I don't want you to be someone else. The Old Testament says that he, he knitted you together in your mother's womb, and he put all of those pieces on that bookshelf exactly the way he wanted and he saw value in it. Jesus recognized your value so much that he was willing to die for it. So for us, don't try to be someone you're not. Don't try to be someone that he never intended you to be. That's that's. Never in the creation of the world did God intend you to be something else. You have value in Jesus Christ. And I would love to say to you this morning, okay, stop. Stop the comparison game. Go home and look at your family and go, this is what I have. This is what God has given to me. Look at your spouse, look at your job. There may be things you want to change. You want to earn a little bit more money. You want a better job. I'm not saying don't start, stop achieving and stop moving forward. Keep doing that. But we have to get to a point, you and I both, where we stop comparing ourselves to others and not diminish what God has done. Let me give you these last two points because this is where I struggle the most. My encouragement to you is this. Celebrate what God has given others. God gives someone something great, try this, celebrate that. That's not your first reaction. It's not my first reaction. Someone has something wonderful happen to them, very rarely do we celebrate that. More often, we're jealous of that. Well, if I would have had that, or I bet they blow it, or I bet they mess it up. No, what, what if we, as children of God, did something different? What if we celebrate what God has given others? And the next part, why don't we leverage what God has given us? Can you imagine if just the people in this room, including those watching online, if we were to say from this day forward, we're going to start celebrating what we have. And when I see someone else win a victory or I see someone else, the kids do great or they get a promotion or they get approved for this house or this great thing happens or they get a great report on their doctor bill, everything just is wonderful. I want to celebrate that. But I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to go home and I'm going to look at what I have and I'm going to ask myself, how can we leverage that for the kingdom of God. When you do that, we will change the world. Whatever point we start leveraging and realizing that I have value, 
and I'm going to use that for the kingdom of God will change the world. So let me ask you to do this. Let me have you bow your head and close your eyes with me for a minute. I realize this type of sermon might be one that um, comparison may not be something that you do. It may, you may do it occasionally, but it doesn't eat at you. There might be others in here that you would say, you're, you've been reading my text messages, you've been reading my diary. I do this all the time. Every time I scroll through social media, every time I see something, I just realize how insignificant I am and how significant everyone else is. And that for whatever reason, God only chose to give me one bag of gold. And so it's basically his fault that I don't have what everybody else has. I know that because you're not alone. I know that I'm not alone in that. I would love for you to start a prayer campaign in your life that says, God, from this point, I'm going to celebrate what you give to others and I'm going to leverage what you've given to me. I'm going to be content with it. Yeah, if a new job comes along, I might take it. If a chance to better myself comes along, I think that in itself was built into you by the word of God, so I'm going to do that. But I'm going to be content with what I have because Jesus Christ thought you had so much value he was willing to die for it. I'm going to give you just a minute to do business with God today, to let this flesh out in your own life however you need to. And then I'll close this in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus today. I admit, God, when I I preach something like this, there's a part of me that I believe that you knew what you were purchasing on that cross. But I'll admit, there's a part of me that's still blown away by it because I know me. I know my failures. I know my faults. But for whatever reason, you chose to redeem me to purchase me, to adopt me, and to give me all of the rewards of being a son of God. And so God, would you let me be content in that? I feel like for myself, for all of us, that I need to ask your forgiveness for the times where I wanted to be something different than that which you chose to redeem. So God, I confess that. I ask that you help me to learn to to celebrate with what you've done for other people. And God, in that same way that you would help me leverage that in my life that I can use for your kingdom. Let me pass this on to my kids. Let me me and and those here, those watching, those that may be watching years from now, God, let us learn to leverage what we've done to leave a legacy that does not diminish what you purchased on that cross. It does not diminish our value. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for not leaving us the way we were, but each day transforming us step by step to be more like Jesus. And God, when we leverage that for your glory, we pray that we receive nothing out of it other than the exaltation of Jesus Christ, that we can look at us when people say, wow, look at what they're doing, look how content they are, that all of that praise and glory goes to no one else but to Jesus. God, and it's in his heavenly and precious name that we pray.